Bo is afraid, but the cause of his fear isn't spiders, homeless people, or women. Bo has a vague dread that redirects and latches onto objects around him. Bo experiences what psychoanalysts call anxiety. According to Jacques Lacan, anxiety is the only emotion that cannot deceive because the object of anxiety cannot be signified. Fear, on the other hand, can deceive. The object of fear is the unknown aspect of what's making itself felt. And once I name the unknown object of fear, the fear dissipates. I see. You scared me too. Kind of like every episode of Scooby-Doo. Dr. Najib! But anxiety is a different kind of fear. A fear whose object cannot be signified. And so, in order to talk about the object of anxiety, we have to talk around it. In order to describe what it is, we have to describe what it is not. The question is, can we encounter the object of anxiety in Bo is Afraid? Or is this movie a deception, a Scooby-Doo mystery? Lacan's Seminar 10 begins with a metaphor for anxiety. In this metaphor, you, the viewer, are wearing the mask of a praying mantis. Suddenly, you are face to face with a real praying mantis. It's a giant, human-sized, female praying mantis. And when praying mantises are mating, the female will often eat the male in an act known as sexual cannibalism. The catch is, you don't know whether you're wearing a male or female mask, so you're not sure what the other praying mantis wants with you. In this metaphor, anxiety can be expressed in a question. What do you want? In other words, anxiety is the overwhelming proximity of the other's desire. So what does Lacan mean by other with a capital O? For a child, the first instance of the other is the primary caretaker. Generally speaking, mother is the first other. Mother appears and then leaves. She is other than me. For Bo, the first other is Mona. It's not a coincidence that Mona, from Greek monos, means one. Of course, the other, as a signifier in Lacan's framework, doesn't refer to an individual person. The mother is merely embodying the other to the child. The other is really an abstraction of the structure underlying society. The other is the symbolic order. We'll come back to the symbolic order, but concerning anxiety, mother can stand in as the other in our metaphor. For Bo, even as an adult, Mona has never stopped being the embodiment of the other. Yeah, like she's like a god. And, you know, that to me feels like a very Jewish <laughs> joke. You know, at the, yeah, it's the, mo the mother is God. Um, or like in lieu of a god, that's what you have, you know? Mona is always watching. There is never separation from her. And so Bo's anxiety stems from the question, what does Mona want? What does she desire? Anxiety, in other words, isn't caused by the other's absence, but by their overwhelming presence. As a side note, we can say with 100% certainty that the cinematic world created in this movie is Bo's perspective, and that none of the other characters are outside of Bo so to speak. I knew early on that I, I, I liked the idea of casting theater actors uh, more than film actors, especially, I, especially because Bo's world is so kind of, it's not real, you know? Like, none of these people are real. 
with with Bo, it was very important that that be grounded and real and it, like vulnerable and exposed and and like you know he's our surrogate through this world. Because we are seeing Mona through Bo's eyes, she appears to be an all-seeing god, and every other character appears to be either working for her or rebelling against her. And so, again, Mona is the embodiment of the other, but what does she want? And more specifically, what does she want with Bo? If the praying mantis represents the other, then what does the mask that you're wearing represent? To put it plainly, the mask is the ego, or the other with a little o. It's a person's imagined whole self that they present to the world. But why does Lacan call it other? If it's your ego that you identify with, then why would it be other to you? The emergence of an ego occurs in a developmental stage called the mirror stage. Just like it sounds, it's the stage when a child looks in the mirror and has the realization, that's me. The catch is, they are identifying with an imaginary construct. They are identifying with an image of a whole self, an imaginary self. In fact, we never really leave the mirror stage because we are continually reimagining a new self throughout the course of our lives. Our ego is always changing. And so, to tie this back to our praying mantis metaphor, the subject is wearing a mask, and that mask is the little other, or the ego, and the praying mantis is the big other. And so the question, what does Mona want, could be rephrased as, what does Mona want concerning this place of the little other, that is, Bo's ego. The answer can be found in the attic, but before we can make sense of that image, we need to better understand desire. All of us, insofar as we've come to terms with the big other as desire, are split subjects. Bo, on the other hand, is not a split subject. Mommy, please! <laughs> please help me, please! Let me explain. In order to become a split subject, there needs to be a separation from the first big other. In this case, Mona. Although the first big other could be father or any primary caretaker. But this separation can only occur if there's a second big other that acts as a wedge prying mother from child. Lacan calls this second big other the name of the father. You know where daddy is. Daddy's dead. Are you trying to hurt me? I don't care, I want daddy. You want daddy too? In other words, a child needs separation from mother so that they can lack. It's a fictional lack based purely on the desire of the mother, but it creates a space in which the child can imagine an ideal version of themselves, an ideal ego that is desirable to mother, and by extension, desirable to the other. It isn't until Mona dies that Bo finally has the space to imagine an ideal ego that he can strive for and potentially present to the world, like a character on a stage. In other words, the subject looks at themselves from the perspective of the big other and asks, what do I need to do now in order to become desirable in the future? This process is called symbolic castration. It's the giving up or cutting away of your surplus enjoyment in order to become what the big other wants you to be. But because the name of the father never separated Bo from his mother, he has no reference telling him who he ought to be. 
the big other's desire remains a mystery. I'm proud of the man you are. And when the name of the father does appear... Bo! Dad! Run! No! Jeeves also appears and tries to destroy it. That is, Bo's drives or instincts resist symbolic castration and the laws and restrictions that go along with it by trying to kill the symbolic father. The birth of a child is the result of the parent's desire for something. Pleasure, revenge, fulfillment, power, immortality, whatever. They may not have even wanted a child, or they may have only wanted a child of a particular sex. Regardless, one or both parents wanted something, and the child resulted from that desire. And whatever complex motives parents have, those motives continue to act upon the child after they're born. Let's take Tony as an example. Oh, Tony, to come here, come here. Oh, she's not dead, that's nice. Come, come in here. Her mother, Grace, desires her lost son. And that desire is due to her own fictional lack. She believes that she would be more complete if she had a son. And by being more complete, she would be more desirable to the big other. But this lost object of desire is always a fiction. It's always a predetermined structure that already existed before we were born. All desire is desire of and for the other. And the other itself is the structure that creates the space for desire. And so Tony wants to be a boy because she wants to be desirable to the other. She wants her mom's love. But of course, she's a daughter, not a son. And the actualization of Grace's fantasy of a son replacing her daughter is a nightmare. There is no object that would fill this fictional lack. Instead, there's a never-ending carousel of perceived objects of desire. Objects of desire that, if attained, would still not complete you, because the lack is fictional. Only desire itself paves over the fictional lack and keeps the nightmare of the real from showing itself. Because we are symbolically castrated, Lacan calls this perceived object of desire the phallus. The phallus functions like a variable in math. It represents anything that would fill the lack and make one desirable to the other. Although in reality, the phallus is nothing. It's like a piece of shit that drops out, leaving a theoretical space where it used to be. The cutting away of the phallus, or shit, leaves a space in which images can appear fantasies. The big other tells us which images ought to fill this space. For instance, the phallus might be money, or a car, or a certain physique, or a certain job. But our desire for those things are caused by the loss of something that we never had to begin with. And it's only in the pursuit of these fantasies that our surplus enjoyment returns to us. To use a more sinister example, Goebbels, despite recent catastrophic losses in Russia, was able to elicit desire in this crowd of German people by appealing to a fantasy of what Germany could be. And because of this fantasy, 
the crowd is able to take pleasure in the idea of sacrificing and suffering in pursuit of this fantasy. Basically, becoming a subject to the symbolic order fucks you for life. But hopefully, the big other you are subject to isn't a monster. Regardless, desire is completely necessary for a subject to exist. And this is where we finally get to anxiety. Because anxiety has the exact same structure as fantasy. Anxiety occurs when lack is lacking. When the space that should be available for fantasy is filled. Anxiety, in other words, is a signal in the ego that occurs when something appears in the place of the phallus and threatens the subject's desire. For a child, anxiety is not the absence of the breast, but its overwhelming presence. Even when you were a baby, you rejected me and refused to breastfeed while every other smug cunt on the street had happy, docile babies sucking their tits dry. Because Mona's desire is for Bo alone, he's unable to imagine an ideal ego, and therefore cannot desire. When I was just starting to like my own stuff and do my own things, she'd take all those changes very personally and get very mad or sad and make me feel bad about it until I stopped. So through the weaning process, she took your displays of autonomy as a betrayal. Exactly. What do you mean? He is like a kid who, during potty training, is told to hold it in like a good boy. And so he keeps holding it in forever. What about eclairs? People hide razors in them. What about rainbow cake? The colors make cancer. What about liquid shit? All of his energy or libido is held in and his ability to grow and become an independent person is stunted. Are you a virgin? Well, it doesn't matter. I am too. I mean, who gives a shit? I have to. It's very dangerous for me. It's genetic. My father died. Here. Suck this off. What? And so, anxiety is not a cause, but a warning. A warning that Bo's desire is threatened, and thus his very existence as a subject is threatened. When Bo enters the attic, he sees two images that had previously been excluded from his reality. He sees his more courageous brother, that is, his ideal ego, chained up and wasting away. And he sees the name of the father, the phallus, the object of Mona's desire. Because the name of the father had previously been excluded from his reality, he can't make sense of it, and it shatters his world. Even his defenses against it fail. It's clear that Bo, as he is, as a child dependent on her, is the phallus that Mona puts on. She wants Bo to avoid symbolic castration, avoid emerging as a desiring subject, and instead be chained to her. She wants him to fill her own lack, to cover over the wound of her own castration. 
Her fantasy is to be the great mother, to act out the role of Madonna in child. And the Son of God is spotless. He lacks nothing. As a contrast, Grace's relationship to her own deceased son gives us an image of mother separated from child, an image of the sacrificed son as lost object Amen. of desire. Amen. Amen. Although the Madonna and child and the Madonna and corpse are really two sides of the same coin. We also see the effect that Grace's desire has on her daughter, Tony. You enjoying my bed and all my stuff? What? Don't you bed? Here we go. I didn't realize that. Oh. <laughs> Bo, take it easy. Tony's happy to give you her room. Yeah, no, it's not like we have a totally empty room available, completely unused. That's right. It's not like that. You know that. Because Grace desires a son, Tony desires to be a boy. And so her ideal ego is an impossibility. For Bo, the object of the other's desire is too close. But for Tony, it's too far away. And just like Tony, Mona wasn't loved by her mother either. My own mother wouldn't even touch me. Not if it was simply to stamp me out if I was on fire. I wasn't worthy of her love. I hadn't earned it, and I never earned it, no matter what I did, no matter how much of my deepest real self I denied and buried and smothered until it was dead, none of it mattered. She blamed me for everything her mother did to her. And so for Mona, to be a boy and to be the phallus are one and the same thing. And so to be desirable to the other Mona wants to put on a son, like a queen puts on a crown. But in order for Bo to be the phallus, he must not be lacking. He still needs his mother, like a child needs his mother, but he doesn't have an ideal ego that he's striving for. He is instead commanded to wait, and when he finally releases, he falls away. He goes flaccid, so to speak. The phallus is like a piece of shit. It's something that was cut off and separated from the subject, leaving a theoretical space where it used to be. When a child is potty training, they are commanded to hold it in, to make it part of their body, and then, on demand, they're told to let it out. When they release into the toilet, they're praised for it. The excrement is given a special value, at the very least, it satisfies the demand of the other. But they may also see the shit as part of themselves. It is, after all, something that a child can create from their own body and offer to their parents. Of course, the child isn't praised for the shit itself. They're praised for separating from it. The shit itself is flushed. And... Bo is like Mona's excrement. Once he sees the name of the father and separates from Mona, he finds himself floating in a bowl of water. He's then judged by the big other to determine whether he obeyed its commands. We are gathered now to assess the extent of the subject's guilt. Whether he is desirable to the big other. I ask you to consider yesterday. Not three hours after meeting a knocked up dimwit who made clumsy eyes at him, did he gift her with a tributary gift intended for no one less than his recently deceased mother. Now, when the pregnant slut offered to return this special gift, did he insist that this total stranger keep We hear the sound of a shofar, a ram's horn that's blown during Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement. The sound of the shofar is the voice of God, and the voice of God 
models or orders the void. It's the sound that can finally bring Bo's anxiety to its point of resolution, to guilt or atonement. The desire of the big other becomes clarified. Bo must be sacrificed. He must be flushed. And yet, Bo seemingly acted out the desire of the big other as it was communicated to him through Mona. There's a dead man in the pool! Is he just here with your mom? Only sometimes. Right now I'm by myself. I'm Elaine. I'm Bo. I'm Elaine. But without an ideal ego, without an image of what he could be, he cannot okay, desire. Let's go. Close off. He cannot emerge as an autonomous subject. And so the object of anxiety is a lack of a lack. A lack of symbolic space in which one can imagine an ideal ego and strive to become it. But one can only imagine an ideal ego if one can see the desire of the other and through metaphor create meaning out of that object of desire. Bo's fate feels inevitable, but there's no reason why we can't break generational cycles and create new ideals. The phallus is the foundation of symbolic structure and meaning, but it's also nothing more than a fictional lost object causing us to desire. And the structure creating that desire is malleable. The big other, as a symbolic structure, is for people, not people for the big other. In other words, this entire structure that I've just described is a fiction. It's not real. It's a concept, a model, a discourse. You can't step outside of the symbolic and see objective truth. But there is a truth to communicating the object of our desire. And by signifying desire, by creating meaning out of that object of lack, the rest of the symbolic order can be built around it. Love isn't being desired, it's desiring. Love is showing your lack, showing the hole in your ego, and having someone else show you theirs. As Lacan says, love is giving what you don't have to someone who doesn't want it. And what you don't have could be anything imaginable.